consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I am a psychotherapist, author, and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. And hello to Sean, our director in our studio. And this is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Today, I will share the tip of the week about ways you might communicate that leads to arguments and fights and becoming aware and shifting. And I will share with you the biggest argument in marriages, which are over finances. Yes, and creating agreement and creating trust is really the key. I bring you Rob Schellenberger. Rob with Steve Schellenberger are the founders of Becoming Your Best Global Leadership and um, are devoted to helping individuals and organizations achieve their maximum potential. Rob has tra trained and coached hundreds of companies around the world, including many Fortune 500 organizations in leadership planning and time management. Today, we will talk about their latest book, Do What Matters Most, Lead with a Vision, Manage with a Plan, and pause, uh, Prioritize Your Time. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast and connect with me through all of the social media, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, any of them. I love to hear from you and hear your comments, questions, and the topics that you want me to talk about. But first, here's the tip of the week. Here's a tip of the week. This week, I have been noticing all the ways we communicate that assure the creation of an argument and then move along toward a fight. So although no one is aware or volunteers to start or continue a fight, the way one begins the conversation, reacts throughout the conversation, or allows arguments to get escalated instead of information sharing or resolution is really being a part and creation of an argument. For some of you who have played tennis or ping pong, know when people are playing to enjoy the game, it's very different than when they only intend to win quickly as if they're in a tournament. An enjoyable interaction starts with a person who serves appropriately so that the playmate can catch the ball and send it back. The interactions will continue until a ball kind of falls in the middle and does not reach the other person, actually pretty much unintentionally. Then they begin again with another set. You know, it doesn't matter who loses, who wins. It's just a matter of the game. Once in a while, somebody wins, another person loses, and then vice versa. Now, in a win-lose competitive games, the hostile gesture starts from the first serve, and all of the interactions are toward making sure to angle the ball in a way that the opponent cannot get to it and therefore lose. For, part uh, for practicing, some even only play with the ball machine, which only throws a ball with no expectation of it playing mutually with another human being. It's just a ball thrown. So observe the way you communicate. Which one of these are you? Do you communicate to exchange information, resolve a matter, co-create together, connect, learn, explore, or expand? Do you communicate to prove a point, I'm right, win an argument, or make sure that they know who, that you are right? Do you communicate to punish, reprimand, discipline, or protect yourself? Are you just interested in the taking portion, uh, talking portion? Are you just interested in talking, only talking? 
and not necessarily listening, just like the tennis ball machine just throws the balls, not interested in receiving or playing, right? So are you interested in the talking portion of the communication as if you are the tennis ball machine? Um, have you ever noticed your part in initiating, developing, or escalating an argument? Have you ever noticed your part in de-escalating or the resolution of a possible argument? Do you listen with the intention of understanding? Or do you listen just to answer back? Do you throw your emotions at others? Or do you observe, feel, own, and kind of like manage your emotions while you share yourself with others? The listening component of the communication with interest and curiosity is an important factor. Most people focus on what they want to say, but not how they intend to listen. Most also focus on the words they use and not the intention or emotion that is being expressed side by side with those words. You're responsible for the containment and management of your emotions, as well as how they are expressed and delivered within a conversation. Many allow their raw emotions to be expressed within a conversation and hold the other person responsible for holding and containing or even taking care of their emotion. It is best to contain your emotion internally and then share your emotion verbally, such as, I'm sad right now about such and such. I'm really nervous and anxious about you know, what's gonna happen. I'm really angry at you because I heard this or I saw such and such and it really made me angry with that. And this might support you not to react emotionally because the reaction would be actually throwing all the feeling at them, not sharing it with them. Remember, if you, want to, if you don't want to argue and intend to have an exchange of information or to get to some resolution, then monitor the way you keep bringing up kind of like the defensive position. Check your dialogue, check your body language, check the tonality. Is it always on a defensive way or an attacking way, accusatory way? Even if the other person is getting emotionally activated or getting escalated, you can still shift and hold the conversation into an opportunity to connect, learn, exchange information, but listening, reassuring, clarifying, and clearly stating what your intention and desires are. For more information with observational skills in your communication style in different areas of your life, go to my workbook, Life Reset, the Awareness Integration Path to Create. a lot of you asking questions and thank you so much for sending me your question. Um, very appropriate about for this segment is actually a question that showed up is um, what do we do when we argue about finances in our cup um, in our relationship in our intimate relationship whether you are married or in this case the person says that they are engaged and they're living together they want to know what do they do so that they don't constantly get into an argument. Well, it really depends on the philosophy and the management of the, the money and maybe even the philosophy in management of the money. Some traditional relationships um, have come to some agreement where uh, one person, usually the male partner, chooses to be the breadwinner and sometimes the management of the um, actual finances of the couple. Sometimes you'll see there's an agreement for one, maybe the male, um, or sometimes the female to be the highest breadwinner, but the other person, maybe the wife or the husband actually manages the money. The managing, what I mean is to really look at um, 
what are the bills, what are the expenses, how do they get paid every week, and then they can come together and start budgeting. Sometimes when they are engaged, um, they might still look at the modern marriages of having uh, both parties contribute financially, regardless of who brings more money, um, and then they manage it together. Or sometimes they um, are very clear where you know, we earn, we put it in a separate account, and uh, we will, each one of us will pay certain bills and we don't have to ever merge this financial concept. Yeah, some people work for them. What I've noticed with most of the couples is that they actually have to come to an agreement. People usually don't talk about money. Um, they feel shame, they feel embarrassed, they feel um, a little bit intimidated to start talking about finances. One is how much the other person actually makes. It's as if it's a secret. And when you're coming to be engaged, living together, or actually um, wanting to uh, be married, obviously, especially if you're married, as far as the law is concerned, your finances are pretty much together. You're going to be responsible and accountable for your finances and probably your husband. So it's important for the two person uh, to come together and look at what is it that my philosophy is? What is it that I can come through and merge with the other person's philosophy? Come together with some agreement. There are some people who have businesses which they can't merge everything that they have in a business, but they can definitely come to terms with how much mm, salary they're gonna give themselves from the business and put it into an account together so they can um, see it, be aware of it, have the information and move forward with budgeting. Information, uh, transparency, uh, having an open hand, uh, being willing to give the other person the information is the key. Um, it's important for us to create that type of a trust. When we sit together, two couples, and look at what is it that we bring? Um, what is it that uh, our expenses are like? How can we budget together? How can we honor each other's taste and what needs to be happening? How can we make it fair between the two of us? Whatever fairness looks like between the two people and whatever fairness looks like within the agreement that they put together. Some of these things can also be cultural where um, the culture itself, the culture of the marriage and um, their upbringing and their family, family of origin system kind of dictated to them what the culture of financial uh, earning and management and responsibility and power be. And sometimes they'll go back and look at that and just kind of like bring the same format into their marriage. Again, if there's an agreement between the couple for um, a traditional way of a family structure to come in, great, as the point is how to get to that agreement. Many people feel powerless and the other person holds all the power. Um, if the breadwinner is the one who holds all the power, the other person feels like I have to constantly go and beg the other person for money or that my vote or what I need is not counted. And those are the times that resentment guilt built. After 30 years of with working with couples, finances is one of the biggest, biggest, biggest issues of argument and biggest issue of non-trust, much more than infidelity. Finances are the biggest issues of non-trust between the couple. And you know, everything you do all day ultimately is going to come back to the, some sort of a financial decision together. So my suggestion is if you can't come to an agreement, uh, call the coach, call me, let me support you in creating that. Um, if you can, on your own, sit down and write all of your expenses together as you live together, the most important ones that are happening every week, the most important ones that are not set, but you need it. And then the you set up the priorities about all how you're going to create your spreadsheet, um, come back and look at it every month together, create budgets together, and you can move forward. This way you'll create trust, transparency, um, a sense of togetherness in decision-making and power. And that usually um, lessens all the arguments and creates the feeling of safety 
and security that comes and uh, then fosters the trust and love. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujan Zain, and I am excited to be with Rob Schellenberger. Rob with Steve Schellenberger are founders of Becoming Your Best Global Leadership and are devoted to helping individuals and organizations achieve their maximum potential. Rob has trained and coached hundreds of companies around the world, including many Fortune 500 organizations in leadership, planning, and time management. Today, we're going to talk about their new book, Do What Matters Most, Lead with a Vision, Manage with a Plan, and Prioritize Your Time. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Fujan. It's so good to see you and be with you. And for anyone who may be watching or listening, thank you as well. And, and I look forward to a great conversation that will hopefully, and I'm confident it will, make it worth your time being here today. Absolutely. I know it will. Now, let's talk first with, uh, about, um, you talk about a couple of principles. Uh, one of them is leading with a vision mm -hmm. and developing a personal vision. So um, I know, so for example, when I've worked with people, uh, many people don't even have a vision or they have a vague vision um, or their vision is not personal or expand it so, so some some of them is not personal and it's just out there and some some visions are really too much out there but there's no like personal emotions involved about it can you share a bit about what you mean by um a vision that is personal to you yeah it's a great question and you know we're talking about our new book do what matters most right and in that book there are three habits we discovered that less than 1% of people apply cumulatively. And it's these habits together that will help us lead a life by design rather than live a life by default. And so habit number one that you've just alluded to there is to develop a written personal vision. And you know, like you just said, I think this is something that a lot of people can relate to in that we've heard a lot about this term, right? Everyone's heard, find your purpose, find your passion, find your why. But the reality is, like you said, Fujian, is it's not being done. And in our research, we interviewed more than 1,260 different managers across 108 different organizations and found that only 2% of people have a written personal vision. Now, a lot of people have thought about it. You know, these intentions, these ideas are in the back of our minds, but it hasn't really gone further than that. And I think this is something that so many people watching or listening can relate to because, you know, let me just give you one example. Uh, I was a former fighter pilot. I flew F-16s for 11 years. And I was just this week with four of my buddies who graduated with me from F-16 training, you know, like 17 years ago. And I haven't seen them for a long time. It was our first time getting back together. And two of these gentlemen are now senior leaders in the Air Force. And one of them said, and this is indicative of what so many people have felt. He said, you know, I've just kind of lost the passion that I once had. It's no longer there. I come back from vac vacation and I'm like, man, I don't want to go to work again. I'm dreading going back to work. And that fire that he once had is gone. And I think a lot of people can relate to that is, you know, what does that look like within you? Because once a person has a personal vision, it becomes like their North Star. It's that internal compass for our actions and for our life. And we're either in alignment with that or we're not. And so in chapters three and four of the book, we walk through how to develop a personal vision. And I would suggest, Bujan, that for most people, it's not a lack of desire. You know, kind of know what we want in the back of our minds to a degree. It's a matter of actually articulating that and getting it out on paper and writing it down and having it become clear and creating that clarity. And if you don't mind, I'll just share two thoughts on this and we can go a lot further and in depth on this if you would like. It's our opinion that your personal vision doesn't have to change the world, it just has to change your world. And a lot of people, I mean, I heard this on another show, they said, well, if I come up with a personal vision, I'm not gonna be Elon Musk. You know, or I'm not going to be name the person. That's not the idea. It's that the personal vision changes each one of our individual worlds. And once we have that written personal vision, it becomes the seed of our legacy. And when we plant a seed in fertile soil, we give a plant a chance to grow or a tree, right? But if we never plant the seed, it never even has a chance to grow. And so this is why habit number one in, in our book is about developing a written personal vision 
that is meaningful and gives you clear direction. So that it does become your North Star, your Polaris, and it becomes a guide for all of our subsequent actions and where we're going. So that's why that habit is so important as the starting place. It's not the problem. We don't focus on the problem. We focus on the solution or the outcome, the vision, if you will. And it becomes a really powerful starting point for people when they go through the exercises and actually take it to completion and do it. And it really, really promotes motivation. As you were talking, um, I recall um, we're in the process. I, I created a, a psychology model, um, which um, clears the past and creates a you know the vision of the future and uh, really creates a space of you being here and now and looking at you know your thought behavior, your thoughts, emotions, behaviors. And one of the things, Rob, that was interesting is that we were trying to do an app um, that has the model in it. And you know, going through the process of um, uh, funding sources and and doing things like to find people who were interested in doing that, you know, you, we created obviously the vision and the mission. But it was interesting when you talked about the personal in the midst of it. At one point, you're like, oh, I don't know where I'm going anymore, and this is you know, I'm hitting the walls and the doors are closed, and what are we doing? And then you, what, what you just said is like, at one point, I returned and I said, well, what is it that I even when I created the model, what was my vision? Like, what was the whole point? And my point was I wanted um, 8 billion people on the face of the earth to have access to this. And the app is actually the access to it. So then I just sat with that piece. I really, really have this desire, a vision to have 8 billion people have access to this material. And that created this whole like, Ooh, <laughs> the excitement again of who says the doors are closed? We're going to go do this and we're going to do that. And I really got how much it motivates people, me and, and others, when you really have the, 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 a personal stake at what's there. And the personal stake is not a selfish one. It is for the world, but there is a personal stake at it. Oh, that's a great comment. You know, that's exactly it. When we have a personal vision that is meaningful to each one of us, if our listeners can come up with something that's clear and give them direction and meaning, just like you said, it becomes a wellspring for motivation. Like it can create a fire within us. And it, you know, as a former F-16 pilot, we would never take off without a destination in mind because who knows where we would end up. Well, in life, how many times do we figure do we go through life without a destination and where might we end up? Well, it could be anywhere. And so going through chapters three and four of the book, we walk people through the questions that they can ask themselves that will help give that clarity on how to develop a personal vision. And if you don't mind, I can just share one more thought on this. In the book, we invite people to look at their, this is a very unique way of doing it. We invite people to look at their five to seven roles that matter most to them. So we all wear different hats throughout the day. Some people are parents. So parent might be a role. If you're in a relationship, partner or spouse, And the most important role is personal or self. You made that point just a second ago. You know, we've got to take care of ourselves and not just come up with a vision, but to come up with a vision for each of those key roles. And what is the very best version of you look like in that role? And I'll just give you one example. So I have four children. I'm a father and a parent and and a spouse. So one of my roles is husband. And this is my role or vision in the role of husband And honestly, I think about it every day. So to your point, it becomes a strong motivator of what my best should look like as a husband. And I know when I'm out of alignment with that and when it's my responsibility to get back in alignment. And I'll share it with you. It's very simple. It's I am a kind and caring husband who always helps Tanya feel like a 10. I am totally faithful in thought and action. And I constantly strive to compliment her, serve her, and be the husband of her dreams. Now, is that how it constantly goes? No. (laughs) But that's where it's my role to get back in alignment with the vision, right? And that's the power of having that vision. That's beautiful what you said. Uh, For our vows, actually, for me and my husband, we did that. We created a mutual vision uh, for our wedding, I mean, for our marriage. And then, you know, we put it up in our bedroom and it's like, well, that's the vision. And I've worked a lot with clients and couples where we've done the... um, kind of their couple, you know, the in in between, not only their personal, but in between uh, the relationship. And it's interesting in what you just said is, do we set the vision and we're always, uh, are we always up to par with it? 
No, but what it does say is, you know, when you're not up to par and you always have the lead to go right back to it because it's there to see. And even when you're talking, whether you're in, a, in, in your personal roles or business roles, it is so amazing that when you have that vision and you, you for, for your roles to, the, to be the best of you, it is so clear than when you're off. And sometimes when we don't have that vision, we're not aware that we're off. Like the offness becomes also part of the norm. Where when you're all intending to be the best in your vision, you catch, you're off, and then you intend to come back. Like you'll be committed to your vision and coming back to that. And, and that makes uh, you in the process of being excellent. You're like, consistently living your excellence. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so that's why, you know, the three habits in the book, do what matters most, that's habit number one. And, you know, it's just ironic. It, you've heard me say this several times, the title of the book is do what matters most. If we in our lives are going to do what matters most, then that is why we need to start with the vision, because that is the right starting point to say, well, what really does matter most to you? What is most important? What does your best look like? And when we get clear on those things, then habits number two and three in the book become very powerful. But like you said, it's so much easier to apply the other habits when we have alignment and we know the direction that we're going. So you talked about roles and then you also talk about prioritizing your time um, and uh, the, the planning uh, that goes into it. And you actually, in your book, set up a matrix. Um, can you share a little bit about the matrix that you offer about prioritizing tasks and times and, and roles and all of it? Yeah. So for those who go through our training, there's four sections that they go through in the participant guide. Section one is what you're alluding to here. And it's the, it's the chapter two of the book. And then it's the application of the three habits. And we have what's called the do what matters most matrix. And just to give you a little background on this, it's really the, the original credit goes to Dwight D. Eisenhower. He's the one that developed this. It's called the Eisenhower matrix. We simply took his version and made some adjustments to it. And that's why we now call it the do what matters most matrix. And so imagine in your mind four quadrants. If you're looking at this, the upper left-hand quadrant is quadrant one. These are things that are important and urgent. Quadrant one by nature is high stress. You know, these are things that are the fire of the day that you constantly are reacting to that just show up. And there's always gonna be an element of quadrant one in any business in any life. But we wanna minimize quadrant one where we can because it's high stress. And if you look at this from a team setting, uh, if a team is constantly in Q1, you're gonna see typically higher turnover lower morale. It's just not an exciting, I shouldn't say it's not exciting. It's a lot more difficult to sustain long-term because it's always high stress, you know? And so it's a challenging place to work and it's a challenging place to live full-time. Quadrant two, on the other hand, are things that are important, but they're no longer urgent. And because they don't have that urgent sense to them, it's low stress. It's a great place to live. This is where being proactive rather than reactive lives. So the whole point of do what matters most is to move a person and a team into Q2. In other words, doing what matters most and not being in reaction mode all day long, personally or professionally as a team. So this is where, you know, all these things like strategic planning, roles and goals, pre-week planning, which is habit number three in the book, all come into play in helping and empowering a person to make the move to Q2. That's where things like exercise happen, relationship building, meditation, all of these things that in the back of our minds we know are important, but for many people aren't getting done, these three habits help us make that move to Q2. That's where we wanna live. Q3 are things that are not important and feel urgent. So imagine now you're looking at the bottom left hand of this quadrant, that's Q3. How many times have you been in a meeting or working on a report and you say, why are we even doing this? <laughs> what a waste of time, that's Q3 things that are not important, but they feel urgent. And Q4 are things that are not urgent, nor are they important. That's the bottom right-hand side of the quadrant. And those are things that are just a total waste of time and you want to eliminate those. So Q1, we want to minimize time in Q1. And the average high producing team spends about 20 to 30% of their time in Q1. High performing teams and people spend about 60% of their time in Q2. That's where we want to live. Q3, less than 10%, you either automate, delegate, or eliminate, and Q4, eliminate. And so here's my question for all the listeners is, where are you at in your life right now? 
you know, as a, as a team, if you're a part of an organization, where's your team at? Is it constantly reaction mode or is it all of these unimportant things that you're working on and how and where do you have opportunities to make the move to Q2 and what impact would that have when you do? And that's the whole point of do what matters most is once we identify where we're at is where in our lives can we be more in Q2 and more proactive and more intentional about leading our life and teams by design rather than by default. And then we move into the three habits after introducing the do what matters most matrix, because that's the whole point of the three habits is to help us take control of our schedule and prioritize our time. So first uh, create your personal vision. So then you look at uh, alloc seeing where you are. So you do the matrix and you create the allocation of, okay, where am I and when is it? So do what matters most matrix first. That's at the beginning of the book in chapter two. And it's kind of an assessment of where are we in life right now? And there's a productivity assessment that people can take. And then it's the application of the three habits to get clear on what the vision looks like, roles and goals and pre-week planning that will help us make that move to Q2 in the different areas of our lives, both personally and professionally. In, in your book, you share that successful people have the willingness to get laser focused on what matters most and the discipline to apply the skill set to achieve it constantly. Um, so when we're talking about the discipline, um, I think it's one of the places also that I've watched um, people have some issues with that. So for example, um, you'll I work with people who um, only um, have the ability to be disciplined by others. Like if they're not, and we see this a lot right now, especially because of the pandemic where people went home or some people were gonna go from a job that they had and they no longer have, they got laid off and now they wanna open their own businesses and they're finding themselves because in, they're not in the same um, structure of a company which created discipline with it. And if they have to discipline themselves, like focus on what's important and move forward, uh, they just don't, like they haven't been used to it. They haven't trained themselves to be self-disciplined. Um, and then we have the other people who are part of the a team, but uh, they rebel against uh, the disciplinary sp starts and set setup that is there. Um, so in your book and with your methodology, uh, how can you support people to be focused and disciplined? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and you know what, we need to acknowledge up front, this is not for everyone. Not everyone is going to apply the skill set. Not everyone is in a place mentally where they want to improve their lives. And that's, that's okay. That, you know, hopefully on their time and their schedule, they'll get to that place. But I acknowledge that's a reality for some people. Uh, you know, we start our book the way you just said, Fujian, which is chapter one is do what Matt, the do what matters most mindset and skill set. And so there's two quotes that we used early on, and I really love this. And I, I apply this to my own life, and I invite everyone listening to think about these quotes and say, well, how does this apply to you? And here's the first one. And it goes like this, good, better, best, never let it rest till the good is better and the better is best. <laughs> in other words, how many times as humans do we settle for good? Where in our lives are we complacent? And in the fighter pilot world, there's an old adage that says complacency kills. And unfortunately, I know people who have died in the cockpit because they got complacent in the cockpit. You know, they weren't paying attention to what mattered most in the cockpit and they missed some key indicators that they should have caught. And unfortunately they crashed. And how many times does that kind of thing happen in our lives or does it seem to be moving that direction? And I would suggest that comfort and complacency are one of the greatest hindrances to forward progress. And the truth is that we all have challenges, right? For some it's relationships, for some it's mental health, for some it's emotional or physical health, it's the workplace, whatever. We all have these different challenges. And so I would invite us to all look at this and say, what are our blind spots? Because it's not what we don't know that should concern us, it's what we don't know that we don't know. And if we're not reading books, if we're not investing in ourselves, listening to this podcast or watching this, these are all great things that can help us remove blind spots that we didn't even know were there. And that's part of adopting that mindset of good, better, best is how can we go from where we are today and get better? And then to your point, the second part of that equation is, you know, assuming that we have that mindset of saying, you know what, I'm willing to put in the effort to get better, to become a better parent or spouse or professional or to start showing up for myself physically or mentally. If a person is willing, 
to have that mindset, then the next piece of the equation is the discipline to apply the habits. And these three habits really become the driver for everything else. For, so whether it is a relationship, whether it is health, vision goals and pre-week planning, the three habits in the book are laid out in a way in the book that they aren't anywhere, anywhere else in the world. And that application of those habits are what become the driver for improving our health, our relationships, for finding that fire and that passion, for showing up in ways that we never did. And so to your point, discipline then becomes the key. And you know, the one way we define discipline in the book, there's probably a lot of ways that it can be defined, is that discipline is about doing the right thing at the right time, regardless of how we feel about it. And pre-week planning, habit number three, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point here, in my opinion, is by far and away the most important habit a person can adopt in their life, because it really is the driver for everything else. There's a discipline required with that. It takes 20 to 45 minutes over the course of Saturday to Sunday for most people. And it's one of those habits that is life-changing 100% of the time when a person does it. Yet having the discipline to do it is key. And, you know, there's some things that can help with that. If a person is really willing and we can set aside that cynic <laughs> or the skeptic that lies in a lot of us, which is a very valid emotion, it's there to protect us. But if we can set that aside and apply this good, better, best mindset and be willing to be disciplined and apply a new habit, maybe we need a coach. Maybe we need a mentor or an accountability partner. Developing the right habits, though, will be one of the keys to having a great life when it's all said and done. And, you know, I, I was talking with someone earlier this morning and they said, people are more important than things. So when we lead a life by design, we start out by taking care of ourselves. Then we start showing up for the other people in our lives, our friends and family. And then we start showing up in the workplace in ways that we never did before. And so it really does start with the right mindset, in my opinion, Fujian, with this good, better, best mentality and mindset, and then a willingness and a discipline to apply the habits when we know they work. So our invitation is very simple. Read the book, apply the habits for four weeks, see what happens in your life, and then be extremely disciplined about at least pre-week planning for the rest of your life, whether that means coach, accountability partner, weekly emails, the podcasts, whatever it is. It starts with the mindset, but then it is the application of the skill set. You also share about uh, developing the right mindset um, also requires a proper expectation. So yeah. um, knowing what it is that I'm expecting and, uh, you know, am I expecting something uh, unrealistic? A lot of times when I've worked with clients, um, their expectations are there's like am i am i having a high expectation and so i'm like well i don't know even if it's a low or a high it just seems like sometimes it's unrealistic and um if a person can bring uh themselves into the space of checking out their what is it their, that their goal is and then setting it up into a realistic concept with themselves it just seems like um, the move and it, would, it, it, it appears that the move toward it, the motivation toward it, the setting up the skills and, and uh, the calendar, let's say, and putting yourself through it, it becomes a much more fruitful and attainable. Well, that's exactly it. So most of us can relate to this. If you're listening, I, I know you can relate to this at some point in your life where there's these things that we want to do, but they've never really left the phase of good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I call them fantasies. Well, they're just sitting in the back of our minds. And again, that could be that could be a health goal that you wanted to achieve. It could be, you know, overcoming some, some sort of anxiety or depression, or it could be a promotion in the workplace or a financial target. We've thought about it a lot, but how do you take that and then make it a reality? And what you've just kind of alluded to and transitioned into is habit number two which is roles and goals. And that is getting real clarity on what does success look like then in each role for this year. And goals are another one of those things that have been talked about all the time. Everybody's heard about goals. The reality is they're rarely being done. So for as much as they're talked about, they're not being done. In our research, we found that only 10% of people have clearly written goals. And so to write these in a way that, like you said, sets us up for success is really important because 85% of New Year's resolutions are broken within two weeks of starting the new year. And that's because of the way they're written. And so that brings with it a real emotion with, with roles and goals. You know, it becomes scary for some people to write it down because there's this fear of failure or it becomes real. 
Well, here's what's exciting. When it's done in the right way, it really does create a laser focus on what matters most. And we're kind of like an elastic band. An elastic band, if it sits in a drawer, will go brittle and break. We as humans are designed to be stretched, just like an elastic band. And there should be a healthy tension, just like you said. And, and here's how we outline this in chapters four and five of the book on roles and goals, is our goals should make us feel slightly uncomfortable in an exciting way. If we look at a goal and say, uh, well, that's easy. Okay, well, we're not stretching. If we look at a goal and say, well, that's impossible, or, ooh, man, that's, that's way out there then maybe we can dial it back a little bit because there is a healthy tension of having a goal that's realistic yet stretches us a little bit to a better version of ourselves in that role. And so I agree with you 100% that there is developing roles and goals is a skill set. Anyone can do it though that will simply read the book. We'll walk you through the exact steps of how to do it. Uh, we'll give you the templates that you can use. It's all done for you. It's all you need to do is read the book and actually go through and just do it. So we try to make it as easy as possible and, and we'll walk that fine line with you of, is it too much or is it too little? Uh, one of the things, the distinctions you made in the book that I really enjoyed was uh, the productivity versus performance, which is productivity is often measured in terms of the rate of output per unit of input and performance is the ability to do something efficiently and effectively. And you bring those uh, delicately together. Can you share about these two distinctions and how you bring them together? Yeah, that'd be great. That's a, that's a good question, Pujan. And then maybe if you don't mind, we could segue into pre-week planning because that's really all about performance and productivity that you're talking about. You know, so think of this, if a person is, if they have a goal to run a marathon by September 1st, well, there's the goal. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's meaningful to them, whatever. They, if they're just starting out and they really haven't been running before, they're probably not going to be in a position to run that marathon if they're just working out one time a week. So quantity does matter. In other words, one workout a week is probably not going to cut it between now and September 1st to be ready for a marathon. At the same time, now let's flip the equation. Let's say we work out five times a week, but they're low quality workouts. That probably won't cut it either. And so whether we're talking about our relationships whether we're talking about our health, all of those things that we've alluded to, quantity and quality matter. In other words, performance and productivity, while they sound similar, they're different things. So we wanna increase our performance and we wanna increase our productivity. A very simple you know, layman's terms of saying this would be, we wanna do more of the right things in our lives. That's a very simple way to say it. How do we do more of the right things in our lives? The things that matter most and will have a big impact in your life. Um, so maybe, so maybe can, I build on, can I build on that and then go into pre-week planning? Yeah. Because it's one thing to sit here and deal in the hypothetical. Right. The reality is how do we actually make it happen? And okay. that's why the habits become so important. This is where they make it happen. So when someone asked me, Rob, of these three habits, what's the most important one? Different people answer that question different ways. The majority of people, including myself, would say hands down, it's pre-week planning. And in chapters seven and eight of the book, we walk through a very specific process. And you know, one of the invitations is read the book and see what impact pre-week planning would have on you. It doesn't matter what your current starting point is. Maybe you have a process, to-do notes or sticky, you know, sticky notes, to-do lists, whatever. We've designed a very simple process. It's only four steps that anybody can use to enhance whatever you're currently doing. And the research that we did around this was fascinating, Pujan. I think you'll find this interesting too is after interviewing 1,200 different people, we found that 68% of them felt like their number one challenge was how to prioritize their time. And yet 80% of people did not have a process. And so this is what's missing most of the time. So whether it's health, mental health or exercise or finances, it's about making time for what matters most rather than just thinking about it. So can I just give you an example of these four steps? Please. We coined the term pre-week planning after pre-flight planning. So you can imagine a pilot jumping in their jet and saying, you know what, today we're just gonna wing it. We're just gonna give it our best shot and see what happens. Well, how's that gonna work out, right? Chaos, confusion. How many times do we go into our weeks without a plan and expect a different result? And that's why for pilots, pre-flight planning is critical. 
Well, for us as humans, if we're going to lead a life by design and show up for our children, if that's applicable, or our partner or spouse or in the workplace, then it's the same concept. We do pre-week planning prior to going into the week. And, and here's a basic outlay of the four steps. Number one, imagine yourself sitting down over the weekend and reviewing your vision and goals every weekend. How much alignment would that create in your life? And only 1% of people do that. You know, 2% of people have a written personal vision, 10% goals, 1% of people review them on a weekly basis. So that is a powerful step in aligning your life towards what matters most to you, especially when you're looking at your life through the lens of those roles. And that then is step number two, just like you did in your vision and your goals, you're going to look at your five to seven most important roles. Step number three is to ask yourself what matters most in those roles this week. So you're having a personal brainstorm with yourself. And that's why pre-week planning is so much different than, you know, sticky notes or to-do lists because it's Q2 thinking. You're asking yourself, what can you do in that role this week versus what do you have to do? And step four is to simply assign a time to it. So that's it. What's your vision and the goals? What are your roles? What matters most in each role this week? And when will you do it? And if you don't mind, Fujian, maybe I just share one or two very brief examples of what happens with pre-week planning. And, uh, and I'm going to share these more on the personal side, if that's all right, because a lot of people are used to thinking about their work roles. It becomes a whole new concept for most people when they start thinking about these other roles of their life that we don't typically think about outside of our, you know, just general thinking. So we did this training with a group of executives with Pepsi. They went through the habits, the do what matters most matrix. They got to habit three pre-week planning and they were going through this process. And in one of them, pretty seasoned looking executive, gray to white hair, early sixties. In his role of father, he wrote, call my son. And we asked him, okay, well, why call your son? You know, what's, that's cool, but why? And he said, well, because my son and I got into an argument seven years ago and we haven't talked since. We're like, okay, obviously a big deal. Well, when will you do it? Wednesday, seven o'clock, great. Well, six months later, we were back with that same team and this gentleman beelines over, shakes our hand and we ask, well, how did it go? And he, this is what he more or less said. And I think we can acknowledge and relate to him you know, in different ways ourselves. He said, I was scared to death to pick up the phone that day. You know, is my son even gonna talk with me? But because it was there, I finally picked up the phone and made the call. And it was amazing because as soon as we started talking, we couldn't even remember what we had argued about seven years ago. And now we talk every week and we're best friends. And he went on to say something that just was jaw dropping. On that same call, he found out that he had two grandchildren who he didn't even know existed. Now there's really two ways to look at this. You could say, what a tragedy that it took seven years to make that call. But the other way to look at this is to say, thank heavens he did make that call when he did. And that he's now showing up as a parent, as a grandparent. And there were two observations from this that were really interesting, Fujian. One, he said, you know, every morning that I woke up, that weight was on my shoulders. I knew I needed to make that call because my son wasn't going to. And yet the very next thought was, I'll just do it tomorrow or next week. And can't we all relate to him in some degree or another? How many things have we been procrastinating that do matter most? And that's why the three habits together take these things that have been in our minds and they make them a reality. So he made that call and you have a father that's reconnected, a grandfather that's now showing up. And he said, honestly, this is the best I've ever shown up in my professional role as a leader. I don't have that weight on my shoulders anymore. It's, it was so liberating and I didn't realize the weight I was carrying. And, and I'll just finish with this last comment on pre-week planning. In our research, we found that a person is 47% more productive in the workplace when they have a balance of success stories across all the areas of their lives. Absolutely. And we could flip that to the negative and say, well, we're 40% less productive when we have something significant going on in our personal lives. And I think the reality is, is we all know this, there's a pretty big blur now between our home life and our professional lives. Yes. We take work home and we take home to work. And so this is the power of these three habits together as they help us have a balance of success stories across every area of our life. And so that's why we have that do what matters most challenges, apply the habits for four weeks after reading the book, see what impact they'll have, and they will be life-changing 100% of the time. And as you were talking, it dawned on me that the pre-week uh, planning also supports uh, the motivation and also supports the discipline that we were talking about. 
uh, because many people, you know, kind of like set up stuff, but it's uh, when you do it for that week, it becomes intentional. And that type of intentionality um, uh, also promotes the discipline because you're, it's not just like you said that I have to, it's like, I'm intending, I'm creating, I'm putting myself in there. And every week um, I'm setting it up and that weekly setup for the next week, it, uh, it, it takes a whole different, um, let's say focus into what I need to do. So I, uh, that's also what showed up for me as you were speaking and how the bringing the internal uh, and personal vision, bringing uh, the roles in there so that my life is balanced and I'm taking everything into account. And when I look at my week, the week is also balanced. It's not just work and, or just personal or just fun or just any of it, but it's all, all of it. And it inspires one to see that my life is in a balanced space. Um, and then there it's scheduled. So uh, all I need to do is show up, <laughs> just show up, you know, I put it in there and then now show up. And I'm hearing that when, when you put these into action, you'll see that the productivity and performance are consistently higher and higher as they go in. Can I share with you? That's exactly it. Can I share with you the research we did on this? Please. This is actually mind blowing. And it's just now it's one of the greatest secrets I hope the world comes to know because it is mind blowing and it really does transform the way we lead our lives. Here's just very three quick points. Two of these are research based. They're in the book so people can really go in depth on the research. I just had a lady last week who read the book six weeks ago. I mean, it was only released, you know, in late May. So it's pretty recent. She read it six weeks ago. She's applied the habits and in six weeks, she's lost 40 pounds. She's come off three medications. She started scheduling family activities every week that never happened before. She started scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings with her different employees, the teams that she's leading, to get to know them and their stories better. And it's been amazing the connect that she's had at work. She says, in six weeks, my life has completely transformed. That will happen every single time. How could it not when a person's looking at their different roles and number one, identifying their vision, habit one, number two, their specific roles and goals for the year, and then number three, doing pre-week planning every week. What's my role? What matters most in each role? And when will I do it? Just by nature of going through that, that's life-changing. And the research behind it is this. A person who's consistent and disciplined about the habits. I love your word that you used earlier, disciplined. This is what happens specifically to productivity. Productivity will increase by at least 30 to 50% across the different roles in our life. That means that a person who is consistent about these habits will accomplish or do 800 to 1,000 things this year that they otherwise probably wouldn't have done. Some of these are small, some of these are huge. And so imagine what happens when a team, all members of the team develop the habit of pre-week planning. Imagine what happens in someone's life when they develop this habit and start doing things that take care of themselves. They start showing up for their spouse or their children in ways that they didn't before or friends or coworkers. And I'll just give you one more simple example of this. Under the role of father every week with my four children, I'm thinking of what I can do with each kid or for each kid that week. So last week, one of the things I did amongst the several ideas I came up with in pre-week planning was to write a little note for each one. So each one has a dry erase board in their room. So, you know, while they were still sleeping, I snuck in with the dry erase, dry erase marker, whatever, and wrote a little note telling them how much I love them. Well, I think we would all acknowledge if we have kids, that's, that's a good thing to do. But how many times would we just do that on our own if we're winging it? And it wasn't until I sat down during my pre-week planning prior to the week in the calm of the day. And in that role of father, I'm asking, what can I do for Lana this week? What can I do for Bella this week? And so imagine in each of your roles, if you're asking that question. So personally, that being the most important role, if we want to keep our flame lit. You know, it's like the birthday cake. We have a flame. And if we're going to light other flames, we need to have our flame lit. So that personal role is the most important, taking care of our physical body, our mental, emotional, and spiritual selves. So everybody who's listening, you know, if you were having this brainstorm with yourself doing pre-week planning, what would you do this week to take care of yourself? Like reading books or exercise. And when's that going to happen? Q2, that's all Q2 thinking and performance and productivity. Both are important, right? So that's why you've heard me say over and over that pre-week planning is the engine that drives productivity and leading that life by design. 
it's really what takes it down to the daily and weekly level. And I'll finish with this thought. I mean, again, the research is all in the book. You can go into more detail on the statistics I just shared. Pre-week planning will empower a person to schedule their priorities rather than prioritize their schedule. Yes. To-do notes or to-do lists and sticky notes, those are typically reactive by nature, things I have to do. We get it. Most of us have done that at some point. The three do what matters most habits, especially pre-week planning, flip all that on, on its head and help us schedule our priorities rather than prioritize our schedule. And then in essence, do what matters most. And I said that was the last one here is actually the last one. The, the expectation is never that a person accomplishes 100% of what they pre-week plan. Yeah. It's important that there's flexibility in, in allowing ourselves to make time for Q1 things that will show up. So 70 to 80% is the target accomplishment rate, and it's okay to miss some things during the week. Q1 things will show up, and the expectation is never perfection. Absolutely. Um, everyone, Rob Schallenberger, uh, the book is Do What Matters Most, Lead with a Vision, Manage with a Plan, and Prioritize Your Time. Um, anything that uh, we haven't shared and in one minute you really want everybody to know? Yeah, a great starting point. Three things. Number one, we have a free assessment that anyone can take. So you mentioned performance and productivity. It's a great assessment to see where you're at in life right now in general. And it will give you an objective score so that you have a starting point. We invite you to go to bybassessment.com. So B-Y-B assessment, becoming your best. bybassessment.com. Take five minutes, take that assessment and see where you're at. Read the book, apply the habits for four weeks. And then if you would like to retake this, the assessment and see what happens to all of your scores and across the board, you will see the measurable increase. And more importantly, you will feel it in your lives. That's what happens when we apply the habits. So bybassessment.com, read the book, apply it, and then retake the assessment and see the difference that's happened in your life. Beautiful. And everyone go to becomingyourbest.com. Um, and get the book, Do What Matters Most, Lead with a Vision, Manage with a Plan, and Prioritize Your Time. Thank you so much for taking the time and being with us. Thank you so much, Fujan. Sure appreciate you doing this and everybody who tuned in and listened. Thank you so much. It says a lot about you and, and you're just doing some great things, Fujan. So thank you for having an impact on the world for good. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And this is an amazing book. It gives you a lot of step-by-step -step tool that you can use immediately as you start with the first chapter. So for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye. KMET, Banning, Beaumont, Redland, and Palm Springs. After a high-rise condo gave way in Surfside, Florida,